All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, just one quick thing. Um, I'm not from here, as you probably realized. English is not my first language, as you probably already realized as well. Um, so I'm Italian, so feel free to interrupt me. That's the way we do things. Um, so I want to give you a quick, very, very quick overview of what we're doing today. This is the first talk I've been told on the Windows track, so I'll be warming up the audience. Uh, we have the main event coming later. We have you know, guys like Rob Reynolds and Ethan Brown, just completely mind-blowing. So let me give you a brief idea of what we'll be doing today besides introducing myself. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Puppet Resource Abstraction Layer, which is a lovely, complicated term. Let's simplify it a bit. I'm going to be talking about specific Windows resources, um, component modules, how to structure your code, how to make your, um, well, how to make the right structures, the right models to, you know, make your model scalable. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about data separation and then, you know, the, the first kind of steps. The whole idea when I start this presentation is for people that are starting using Puppet and Windows, to make sure you take the right first steps and then you don't have to be refactoring your code, you know, maybe six months or a year down the line. Um, just for my benefit, how many people are actually using Puppet on Windows right now here in this room? Oh, God. A lot of people are going to be bored. <laughs> All right, so as I mentioned, I'm not from here. Um, the guy dressed in the dinosaur outfit, he's not from England as well. He's Australian, that's my friend James. Uh, this is slightly more serious. Um, my name is Nicolas Corrello. I'm a senior technical solutions engineer in Puppet based technically out of the London office, although I'm mostly helping countries in Europe. You know, it's, it's a big turf. Um, so where this all came from, who was in PuppetConf last year? All right. So it was in Portland. And I was doing Windows demos in the booth. And um, a gentleman approached me. Um, he was from Rochester, New York. You probably can guess the company. And he went like, you know, I have, my, I have Puppet, my Linux guys love it, my Windows guys don't get it. What can you actually do with it on Windows? And I went like, well, that's, that's a strange question. You can do whatever you want. What do you mean? It's like, yeah, you know, whatever Puppet can do in Linux or any AAX or in Solaris or what have you, it can do it on Windows. Uh, that was slightly, you know, a, a, an accurate reflection of his face. He was like, all, all he heard was chocolatey and, you know, different things, but he didn't really get how it works. So I thought, okay, maybe we are not delivering the message in the right way. So let's do a talk on that. So let's start with the big one. Puppet is all about modeling, okay? We have different models for different resources. And all that goes into the resource abstraction layer. It's this intelligence that the software has that allows you to, on one hand, take the desired state of a particular resource and implement that desired state whatever the platform is, okay? Within that um, resource abstraction layer, you have what we call types, which are definition of the models, okay? What kind of properties a particular resource would have like if it is a service, if the, what's the current state of the service and if it should be enabled at boot time, or things like that. If it is you know, a file, it would be the content, the permissions, and so on, okay? And then you have the bits that actually handle the implementation of the resources, which in the abstraction layer, they are called providers, okay? That's what allows Puppet to basically be you know, platform independent. Puppet knows how to apply a desired state in different platforms, okay? regardless of what's the resource. But um, of course, different platforms, you know, they are 90% alike when we talk about some generic terms, when we talk about a file or we talk about a service. And you know, they each have their different intricacies. Um, Windows is quirky. <laughs> yeah. No. So we have a number of modules that extend that resource abstraction layer to manage things that are Windows specific. Let me give you an example. There is no other platform that has a registry, the concept of a registry. There is no other platform that manages ACLs like Windows. Those are very Windows specific things. So what you do is basically, you can use the base set of types, okay, when you're talking about the file, the service, the scheduled task, and so on. But for, for platform dependent things, we would generally put that in a module, okay? That doesn't mean it's supported better or worse in Puppet. It's just the packaging, OK? 
case. Puppet on its own supports about you know, 20 or 25 base resources. The rest is just extended through modules, okay? And of these modules, if you're actually using Puppet Enterprise, um, they, they are supported. You know, and when I'm talking about these specifics, I would be talking about things like you know, um, ACLs or the possibility of executing PowerShell scripts or um, the PowerShell disaster state configuration engine. Are you all familiar with that? Okay, which is just an R interface um, for configuration. And you can just install this. This is actually a meta module that will download a number of modules you know, that get you a set of resources. So since we're on the matter of interfaces, and you know, hopefully you get it by now, the whole idea is to model configuration around. Let's talk a little bit about interfaces in Windows because that's, this, this is just a fact of life. You know, managing a Windows system, that's, that's really, really easy. Now, when you're going to scale that to 100 or 200 and you're going to you know, point and click, things get slightly more complicated. And it, in Unix, you know, the model is pretty simple. It's generally just a text file, okay? It may use like the INI file format or it may use some other format, but it's generally configuration is driven by a file, okay? And then it's just you know, a package and a service and that's it, it's working. Now in Windows, um, let's say it's less restrictive on how you model configuration. So things are just you know, configured through the Win32 API. Again, when we're talking about large scale, no, when we're talking about configuring a single server. You have the registry, you have certain software that uses text files, PowerShell. Um, you have, of course, you know, the GUI, you have WinRM, and then you have certain proprietary of binary files, which generally pose you know, a challenge because it's, it's slightly harder to model. It's not impossible, it's just slightly harder. You just have to basically wrap up a lot of um, script execution. Now, this is very important because um, it's not only that um, there are a number of interfaces, the thing is, in Windows, you can configure one single thing through multiple interfaces. And not all of those interfaces actually perform alike. So let me give you a nice example of the he choose poorly um, you know, kind. So um, one of the customers I work on is a large uh, telco in Europe. I'm not going to name the country because it's basically the largest telco in that country. And um, they had an abstraction written for firewall rules in Windows. So what they were doing is just using NetSH. So whenever they need to, you know, they manage by exception, and whenever they need to open a port in a Windows system, they basically call the NetSH command. Okay, and that NetSH command effectively created, um, you know, an exception on the firewall, they had a port open. Okay, and of course, Puppet is important, so they had a set of conditions, and for every port, they actually checked if the port was already opened on the firewall. Okay, they're running two commands. So this is the command to set, and this is the command to check. So Puppet will go and run this command unless this command returns zero or one. Um, so when they initially tested it, they were like doing it with you know, five, 10 ports on a live environment. Now, what they weren't thinking is that, you know, in production, they were actually opening like maybe 80 or 100 ports. And that made their puppet runs go really slow. Remember, this is just NetSH commands running. Now on the other hand, and as Puppet allows you to basically abstract yourself from the interface, there was a much quicker way to do it with DSE. DSE has an ex-firewall resource that basically allows, I don't know why, it just performs better when setting firewall rules. So what they did basically is they had these, um, you know, this Windows firewall module that they just stripped the logic that used NetSH and added logic to use DSEX firewall, okay? Immediately making the, mo the module faster. So when it comes to interfacing Windows, choose carefully or, you know, you can end like the skeleton Nazi in Indiana Jones. Um, those kind of modules, I'm going to, I'm talking about modules generally, Kelly, and we use the word module in Puppet a lot. But those kind of modules are um, generally what we call component modules, okay? It's what's, what wraps directly around a particular technology, okay? So for instance, those are the modules you would generally find on the Puppet Forge, the SQL Server module, the IAS module, okay? Things that know how to work with a particular technology and that extend the abstraction layer for that technology. Um, 
there is a very good variety in the porch, but sometimes you're using a homegrown application or sometimes you just don't have it and you just have to write something yourself. So um, I was trying to come up with an example, uh, you know, something we could actually work and discuss and I can show you, you know, bits of code in this presentation. So I went back to say, okay, what are the 10 things I, you know, configure in a Windows system and I, you know, thought of BG Info. Who doesn't know what BG Info is? One, two. BG Info, it's a really cool script that basically modifies your background with the server information. So when you log in through RDP, you actually see the whole information about a system. Super simple, it's one of the system kernel tools. Um, and it wasn't on the forge, so how is this not a module, right? This is just like a package and, and one file and, and that's about it. You know, just add it to the startup tasks and boom. It's very useful when you have like 10 RDPs open on different window systems. Um, so what are the key elements? What do I need to configure, okay, to get this working? So I need a package, of course, the BG Info package, um, which I'm installing using Chocolatey, who hasn't heard of Chocolatey. Excellent. You haven't heard of Chocolatey? Oh, no, okay. Okay, if you want to hear more about Chocolatey, Rob is speaking later specifically about Chocolatey. So I'm just using Chocolatey, installing the package, and um, then it's just a configuration file, okay? And you know, if I have a variable that is set of true, if set on start, then it will just create a, a startup item under all users, you know, to just load the script whenever any user logs in and modifies the background. Super simple. But what about that file? I don't know if you've ever seen this on GitHub, but you know, this is when GitHub tells you, hey, that, that file that you have there, that's not technically text. Because for some reason, and maybe someone here can actually explain me, um, the, pe the person that wrote BG Info added like a nice set of control characters in that file. <laughs> okay? So most of it is readable. So I could actually, I don't know, for example, template it. I could just keep modeling inside the file and adding conditionals in the module, say, okay, show the host name or show the Internet Explorer version or show the MAC address and so on. But then I don't know if I'm actually breaking that file. Um, I actually put on my presenter notes, I'm still thinking if I should model that file or not. I'm still thinking. I should have decided that by now, but, you know, I'm still thinking on how to do that. Um, but if you actually go to the GitHub uh, page of that module, you will see that there is a person asking exactly the same thing, and I said, you know, I'm still thinking about it. But um, in any case, it's not necessarily bad, okay? So for instance, you can have just a static file because probably this file is going to look exactly the same on all your servers, right? So you don't need to reinvent the wheel and you don't need to go to great lengths saying I'll model exactly everything. Just model the things you need, okay? If you're going to configure any application, being BG Info or being uh, you know, a SQL server or whatever proprietary applications you, you may be running, you're generally not, hopefully not, um, having just a bunch of snowflakes and each deployment of the application looks differently. The only thing you're changing is maybe a couple of things, the host name and so on. So, you know, when it's something like that, if you want to ship a static file, that's absolutely fine as well, okay? Again, make your modules as reusable as possible, but just don't go into analysis paralysis thinking, what else do I need to abstract from this configuration? Are we clear so far? A lot of yes, that's good. Okay. When you're writing these kind of modules, just you need to be conscious about uh, you know, a certain number of things. So again, BG Info module, super simple. Just get a package, deploy a file, run a script, and boom, goes down, it's working. Um, but for instance, the first, the first thing I hit when writing that module is um, assumptions. What if you have ESC enabled on Internet Explorer? then you won't automatically be able to go and pull something from sys internals because that domain is not a trusted site, right? Do your servers have ESC enabled by default? Don't they? How far do you go with assumptions? So start considering those pre-requirements, okay? Um, in the case of that module, I actually, um, and just to show you real quick, um, where is your screen? There it is, great. 
All right. So just to show you real quick. Um, so let's go to manifests. As you can see here, maybe you can't see here, but I, you know, I want you to see it. Maybe that's better. Okay, I just added a variable, you know, if a trusted site, okay, I'm just taking into account that some people may have ESC enabled. So if a trusted site is set to true, then actually add the registry keys. So this would work with ESC. Okay. These are some of the Windows intricacies you need to take into consideration when you're writing component modules for Windows. Okay. By the way, Unix have like a thousand of them. It's not really different. But you know, just take into account these kind of things. Think defaults. Um, and by the way, you will hear, you, you will realize that some of these things are actually not just Windows specific. These are for every platform. When you think of defaults, think of saying defaults, think of your module just working, you know, just if you include it without any parameters. So they should have technically same defaults, okay? And then think of the scope of your module, finally. Um, like for instance, I added an ESC site there on that module, but I don't know if there is another module that someone wrote to manage ESC sites, okay? So if you're working on a large organization, start thinking scope. Start thinking if that shouldn't be part of a different module. That's component modules in nutshell. Now let's talk about wraps. Um, this is an English breakfast wrap. Um, what we, gen we, we don't generally just use those modules, okay? That would give people a lot of freedom and what you're trying to do generally in your, organi your organization is standardize these kind of things, okay? So your module may give you 20 customizations um, on, on one particular set of technology but maybe only five are relevant for your company, and the other 15 are just basic defaults or things that, you know, from a security perspective, you just need to set in a particular way. So that's why you model around these modules. You wrap them up, and you, that's why you use this profiles and roles model you have been hearing about. Who hasn't ever heard about profiles and roles? Okay, good. So the definitions. Um, when we're talking about a profile, we're talking about a technology-specific wrapper class, okay? So we're wrapping it around a certain technology-specific thing, okay? A web server is a technology-specific thing. Now, that web ser that, now, in order to set up that um, web server, you may need to use more than one module, okay? The most common use of that, the, the most common profile is your baseline profile. What is the basic things you set up on every single system, okay? And that's not including one component module. Maybe including, you know, 10 or 15 component modules, depending on what you're doing with it. And then you have the role, okay? Which is the business-specific wrapper classes. And one more thing. Um, those names are entri entirely arbitrary. Uh, this is a, a quote from Gary Larissa's blog. Um, we call them profiles and roles. Uh, you can call them whatever you want. Puppet doesn't need something called a profile or something called a role. If you already, in your organization, use a different business name, if you will, for this kind of configuration, by all means, use it, okay? It's the format and the way we are wrapping up those classes in order to make them as reusable as possible that finally matters, okay? Because let me give you an example. Um, you may think all baselines are alike. All servers should have like this particular base configuration. And then again, you have one business user that says, I don't want TSC enabled, and that's not part of my baseline. So then you would have to rip off all that code and write a new profile. So it may seem ridiculous, but the whole idea is that profiles should actually, you know, maybe include other profiles, not only modules, and again, they should be as reusable as possible. You should parameterize this as much as you can. So this is, you know, this is kind of good. 
Okay, you have all the base configuration, um, but actually that's better. Can you tell me what's the difference between those two? Huh? So you can include more than once, yeah, but what's there that's missing there? <laughs> Default parameters. Okay. So where did your configuration go? Who hasn't heard about Hira? Okay. Hira is a key store. Just as when you write an application, you don't store your business logic where you store your business data. You know, as the most common example, you would use a database or whatever. Well, your configuration, you just take in Ohira. Okay, you put it separately. Okay, it's just a key value store. It has different backends. You could use YAML, you could use LDAP, you could use even you know, hardware and encryption stuff to actually keep your information on Hira. But the whole idea around this is that your business logic gets separate um, from your um, code. This actually um, comes from a standard that uh, has been set, actually this has been implemented in a standard by the UK government called the 12 factor app, which um, a colleague is going to talk about later, um, actually a colleague from the London office, um, his talk is at um, 345. But the whole idea is that, you know, your configuration is one thing, your parameters is a completely different. Your configuration should be almost as, you know, almost as stripped of business sensitive data that you should be able to just upload it to GitHub and no one would be able to make use of that or understand how that particularly is applied on your specific systems. And of course you can store the encrypted properties in Hira. Okay, so if you need to, for instance, manage your local administrator passwords for your Windows system, you can actually rotate them as encrypted keys. And finally, let me talk about roles. Um, and this is where uh, we are very strict with rules. Roles can only include profiles. Every node is classified with one role because that's effectively how you get the quick overview of what that node is doing, okay? Roles can use inheritance, but very importantly, a slightly different role is another role. It's not the same role. When you're looking at your systems, you don't go like, oh, that's kind of a web server. It's either a web server or it's something else, okay? So a slightly different role is just another role. Are we clear so far on these basics? Does anyone have any questions? So, when I started thinking about how to actually implement this talk, I said, okay, let me go back to my Windows sysadmin days. I've been in both sides of the fence, by the way, and I said, what are the 10 first things I configure in a Windows systems? What are the, you know, the, the 10 things that anyone can relate to, that anyone can understand? So, this is the list I came up with. Um, it might be similar to you, you might have more, you may have less. But you know, it was just to give you an initial idea, an example of what 10 first things you can start configuring in Windows systems. Okay, so for instance, domain membership. Most systems would be part of a domain. Some system would be standalone. If they're standalone, you actually need more Puppet than less Puppet. Um, BG info, an antivirus, uh, a login message. Yes, if you're on a domain, you may be putting that um, on the dom you, you may be putting that on the domain controller or, or in SCCM. But then again, someone may go and remove that registry key and out goes your uh, login message. A lock administration, you know, firewall rules, ACL, the Windows time, which again, if you are in a domain, eh, that's kind of managed by Active Directory. Now, I, it has happened to me that for some weird reasons, I had a server running, you know, a year connected to Active Directory and the time configuration is just gone. And I cannot troubleshoot why. Well, I'd rather have Puppet checking if it's there. Things like a monitoring agent, things like register keys. So I'm going to go one by one, and I'm going to go real quick. If you want me to stop on anyone, just stop me. So domain membership. Um, the best way to handle it is through um, the domain membership module. It's written by Tom Lincoln. He's one of our employees. Um, this is not a supported module. This is just very widely used. Um, this organization I was telling you about in the Netherlands, they, they have like about 6,000 servers and they configure domain membership just like this, okay? 
what it sets up is a register keys and run the right commands to ensure a, a, a proper join. So if the server is not joined to the domain, it will join it back. Um, best advice, use Hira for data separation. You probably have like a, um, a domain admin that has a limited set of permissions just allow machines to join domain. That password needs to go on Hira. Okay, encrypted, yes. Yes, we have a culture of doing it. It would be generally driven by customer request. Is there anything that does support the domain? Um, yeah, modeling around the specifics, which is basically what this module does. Okay. So for instance, this module is technically not supported, but it's using registry keys and exec, which are supported. So it's, it's a bit of a gray line, okay? Um, BG info, not widely used. I just wrote it as a proof of concept. I'll probably keep maintaining it. If you have any PRs, please feel free to send them my way. Um, I just thought it was a cool and nifty tool to have. Um, antivirus. This is an interesting question because most antivirus are like in a you know, <coughs> enterprise environment and in a antivirus agent server sort of way. That is mostly handled by, handled by an external system. And what you actually may need Puppet doing is deploying the, the, antivir the antivirus local agent. So it could be just a package you have in your local travel <coughs> repository. It could just be an MSI. The nifty thing about this is ensuring that no one's actually um, deleting your antivirus. So you're running, uh, you're running like the, I, I have heard of that. Yeah, the one that, that, that talks directly in, um, with vCenter and things yeah. like that. It's an NFX plugin. Okay. You may not need to model it. Again, these are my 10 things. You could have different 10 things. You can have 12 things. But these are just examples I had. Yes? When you're saying that you rely on like a VPN server that will push out exclusions and the policy for your folders and directories, how would that, how would Puppet what? relate to that? Again, it, Puppet in this, particular model, it would just push the package. Right. Now, if, you're hand, if, if you now have a centralized model and you're handling you know, things like local exclusions, you would probably have to model around that. Whether it is a configuration file or you have a binary that actually would give you local exclusions. And that's where it slightly gets more complicated. That's where you may need you know, a, um, a component module to manage that antivirus. Um, the login message. Um, again, if you're in a domain, probably not an issue, but um, the supported MOTD module supports Windows. I know that because I actually wrote that, um, that part. It used to, be just a it used to be just a Linux thing. So if it's running on a Linux system, it will drop it on ETC uh, MOTD. If it's running on a Windows system, it will drop it on the right register key. So basically, you can just standardize that on all your systems. Um, the local administrator. Uh, so this is where you know, we go back to interfaces. You can, for instance, use the DSC user um, resource, that's absolutely fine and supported as well, or you can just use the Puppet user. Now the thing about the DSC user interface is that it is Windows specific. So it actually has certain parameters that are you know, specific to Windows. The password never expires and, and, and things like that. Again, depending on your use case. If you need to model to that granularity, you probably want to use the um, DSC user. Um, firewall, just use DSCX firewall and manage by exception. Please manage by exception, okay? Block everything and just allow the ports you, you actually want to. How it's generally done in Puppet is when you are, if, when you have the profile that actually deploys the whatever that listens on a particular port, you would just add the firewall exe um, exception there. So when that class gets included <laughs> on the in the catalog, as long as deploying the service, it will open the firewall rule, okay? You want to ensure that they're both, um, they're both containing the single class. So, you're al so you always know that when you're deploying a web server, you're opening the right port, okay? So ACLs, um, we have a supported module. It has been around for ages, supports a full um, NTFS ACLs. Um, it has been um, used for ages. Now, Windows time, again, as the, with the BG info, uh, Mo module, I, I just was like, how is this not a module? So I just wrap, configura wrap configuration around it. What it is, basically, it's just a couple of register keys and a binary to resync. 
that's about it. You just have to pass it a structure with the, um, the actual NTP server and the priority. If you don't feel comfortable using mine, just you know, grab the code and you know, write your own registry keys. Um, the monitoring agent. Much like with the antivirus case, it really depends. Um, if you're using SCOM, um, you would probably just deploy an agent and you know, SCOM will do um, discovery, but there are thousands of monitoring solutions, so it really depends. So if you're managing monitoring on the agent side, you probably, again, need to wrap some code around how to manage that, but generally it's a centralized solution. You deploy an MSI and you just keep going. So finally, registry keys. Um, the registry module has been around for ages. Uh, registry keys or values just goes and creates them and manages them by the desired state. I want to show you, you know, just a quick example I built specifically for this, if I can find RDP there, great. So, um, this is a control repository that I have created with all these examples. Who doesn't know what a control repository is? Great. So this control repository has an example made as much as the best practice as I could think, to be honest. So let me start with data separation. I have my, hi my higher data here. Now, what I'm doing that is not probably up to best practice is that if you look at my common um, YAML file, which has the information for every single server, um, I have a particular password which is just um, on plain text, as you can see here. The other interesting thing, and um, there is a lot of discussion about this, is how you actually retrieve those values from Hira. So Hira will actually populate your variables in the puppet code, okay? Um, depending on who you ask, it will tell you to do one thing or the other. So you can either define a variable and do um, a Hira lookup in your code, or you can just define the full scope in Hira and populate that variable, which is what I'm doing here. Both works. The only difference between one or the, or, or the other is that if you have people that are not familiar with Hira and not really familiar with using Puppet code, what it may happen is they, they, they're going to start looking up where is this value coming from because it is a bit magic. Now, if you're using, if you're using a Hira lookup in the code, you're definitely pointing them to Hira. Okay, it's just a code re readability issue. But here I have my parameters. You know, I have my MOTD message. Um, my local administrator name and password, the ports I should be opening on a system. Um, as you can see, these are just, you know, like RDP and WinRM. These are not things I'm actually, they're, they're actually application related. And then I have, you know, my NTP servers and, and so on. And this code is being read by a number of profiles I have created. So if you go to site, of all windows, you will see that I have created like a ton of profiles. Why I do that? To maximize reusability. What I consider my baseline or what a particular business unit considers their baseline might not be the real baseline. So split it up, split it up as much as you can. It's just adding an R file. If you go to my baseline, what you will basically see is um, now I have a reboot because I'm installing PowerShell, so on, but what you basically see is just includes, okay? It's not adding complexity, it's just making it more flexible so you don't have to go and rewrite code, okay? So I'm including, you know, a profile Windows Chocolatey, a Notepad++, um, a login message, you know, the Windows time, and, and so on, which are reflecting to, back to those basic classes. So if I go to like the base firewall, no, you will see that um, I'm basically iterating over that open ports that I had defined in Hira, and I'm just creating you know, an X-Firewall rule to allow those ports. Yes? Yes, with Hira YAML. So whatever you store in Hira can be stored encrypted using GPG, using eYAML, um, and there are a number of things. There are a number of ways to encrypt it. 
So if you want to dig into that, that's just an example of how to do it. Then what I added is I created a new role with one of the references application that Microsoft has, um, which is the fourth coffee um, bakery. Um, so, sorry? I had a question on your profile. Yeah. I see you're excluding profiles inside your profile. Yeah. Do you find it easier to do the exclusion of the profiles where you have lots of stuff and it's a huge team of that do this and do the next one and the next one, or would you rather have a role that has maybe 50 profiles on it, but they never include other profiles? So roles include other profiles anyway. Um, the, the only reason why it's split in that way, where I, while I'm including all the profiles, is again, just to reuse those bits of code. The idea is, again, it, might, it may sound like a baseline, but it's not the same baseline for everyone. And you don't want someone going and having to, you know, copy that same long block of code with all your research declarations and creating a baseline too that looks 90% the same. Okay, it also creates drift. Like if I'm, if uh, my baseline for my um, SQL servers doesn't include one particular thing, I can just take that thing out and the rest is completely standard. It's the same I'm using. I'm sure because I'm just including another profile. I'm abstracting over it. I know if that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, it might be more complicated to read, but it's more reusable. Yeah. If you look at the role, and I'm going to show you in a second, that's basically what I'm doing. If I go back to my role, give me a sec, I need to find my mouse. Where are we? Site, role. If you look at this role, what I'm basically including is just two profiles. Okay. But those profiles might have other profiles in them. But those profiles may have other profiles in them. Okay. Ten minutes. Okay. Good. So just real quick, what I'm going to do is actually classify that so you see it on a roll. So this is my classification. By the way. 10 minutes after this, I actually upgraded to the latest version of Puppet and it went fine, so I feel pretty proud of that. Uh, I'm going to just add that role. Now, just one thing on that. If you're actually using Puppet Enterprise, you have the full containment view. So you can actually track those resources and the containment within the included profile. Um, actually, if you go to the, um, um, to the node graphs, I'm happy to show you later, you can, you can go and do it. So I include the class, I'm just going to let the Puppet agent run here. Okay, and configure everything that is included on that role. And in the meanwhile, if you have any questions in the, what, six minutes we have left, I'm happy to take them. So there is actually a GPO module that would read your GPO files and apply that local policy in the forge. And it would actually apply it in the, in the puppet way of applying it. It would you know, ensure that each GPO is set as desired and every 30 minutes it would go and check it. So you can start with that and maybe then start moving that into, I don't know, different resources. But you don't really need to because GP, uh, a GPO, um, Sorry, uh, uh, one particular policy is just a configuration um, resource for Puppet. Yes? Do you have any integrations with NuGet packages? Um, Chocolaty actually uses NuGet packages. Okay. 
So every, every package in Chocolate Tea is just no good. So we'd like to get the <coughs> questions on the recording, so let me <laughs> pass the mic to you. Sorry. So any recommendations for integration testing on Windows? Because uh, Linux has server spec. Uh, do, does Windows have any, anything like that? You mean to actually run tests on Windows? Yes. So um, what the people I know are doing is just running server specs on Linux, but you know, just bringing up um, Windows systems, uh, at least on the Puppet side of things. I know there is a testing framework for PowerShell. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, that's it. You would you would end up running you would end up running it on a Linux CI anyway that would use server spec to bring out um, Windows systems. I don't know of any framework that can actually do that on Windows. Okay. Oh. Sorry, what? The? What this, sorry? What does Haskell do on Windows? Oh, it's, it's just um, unit testing for your PowerShell code. Um, it, it just checks that your PowerShell code does what you think it should do, so when you introduce a change, you get automatic testing on that, and you ensure that you don't break your application. Um, with external facts available, is there any tie-in to be able to use something like PowerShell to query or be able to pull facts out of um, a local system to identify this, this particular server is running IIS, this particular server is running ex besides just using a, like a, a naming standard to be able to actually pull facts back to where we can actually classify systems um, dynamically to be able to say, okay, this server got spun up, oh, and some technology like um, BitLocker uses yeah. IIS to be able to manage it. I want to be able to now manage with Splunk those logs, but I need to go create a monitor for those IIS logs. So is there a way that we can pull back custom facts or, or pull back facts about what's actually running on a Windows system because not everything's a package that I can just go check in Chocolatey? Yes. Um, so basically with facts, you can just invoke an external partial script to return um, a key value pair. So if, you, if you're comfortable writing in PowerShell or Ruby and just querying the Win32 API to look for a particular, <coughs> is this particular role installed, for instance, you can get back that information and you can use higher for classification or if you have Puppet Enterprise, you can just use the node classifier and apply a separate class. Any Thank of those work? Can you use CQ off or not? Um, the question is if you, if you could use PQL you can use PQL once you have the catalog to actually find elements that can be classified that way. So for instance, if you have this particular fax on a system, then you can use PQL to give you a list of the systems that have this fact equal this value. So once you export it. Yes. All right. Do you have any more questions? Okay, so just to show you real quick, this is just finishing. It's. Um, Actually, downloading the, um, the website and everything, this might take a little while. Done. Great. So let's see what we have on local host now, assuming it works. That's nice when a demo works. So if we go back to the firewall, for instance, just to show you an example, you will see a merge of all the X firewall resources I created. So for instance, this one that come from my, um, you know, my baseline profile. And this one that actually calls from my fourth coffee class that actually implements the system. Um, I'm going to go and log out just to show you some of the, our neat thing. Again. Absolutely. So let me re-log in and continue. I have a minute, that's great. So I have done my nice message of the day, which was set up as a registry key. And of course, as I log in, um, it will set up my nice DG info background. Right, hopefully, I know some of you were already quite advanced with Puppet and Windows, but hopefully this gives you an idea of some of the other things you can do. If you have any more questions, I'll probably be around the blue shift um, demo, shift for the demo booth for the rest of the day. So feel free to reach out. 
thank you very much for your time and have a nice day.